very nice looking Jeep key fob on this podium that was found in the parking lot. I'm going to assume that this is not a donation. Um, and if this is your Jeep, um, you can come up here and it will be right here for you to retrieve uh, at the end of the meeting. Oh, great, perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Excellent. All right, if you would open your Bibles to the book of Colossians. Colossians, if you're new to the Bible, that's towards the end, kind of halfway through a bunch of letters. Colossians chapter 3. We're just going to look at two verses this morning. And, and just by way of reminder, we just concluded what for me was a magnificent study in the book of Acts for a year. And I love journeying through that book. I'm, I'm, I'm sad to see it go, but there is more parts of the Bible. We, we have to study together. We can't stay there forever. So uh, we, we are doing a, a brief, what we might call a, a topical series. In other words, we're going to be looking at, at different verses um, focused on a particular topic around this idea of real godliness in real life. Uh, so Aaron spoke on fatherhood last week. I heard that was a fantastic message. If you haven't heard it, I would listen to it online. Um, I'm going to be talking this morning about our thought life. Uh, we're going to be talking about our contentment with our possessions, our giving, our speech, our views of others and how we relate to them, our vocation, in other words, our day-to-day -day work and what we do. And, and, and the goal here is to talk about how does the Bible speak to our Wednesday morning or Friday night or Monday afternoon experience. It's, it's real godliness in real life because that's where godliness actually takes place. Um, it doesn't just take place on a, a Sunday morning when we're singing. It takes place on a Wednesday night when we're talking with someone else or Monday afternoon when we're allowing thoughts to run around, around in our head. That, that's when godliness takes place. It takes place in our checkbook. It takes place in our calendar. It takes place in our, our conversations. That, that's where we reveal who we are as Christians. And so this morning, I, I want to talk about our thoughts and I want to actually let God speak to us about our thoughts from the book of Colossians. Let's just read. We're just going to look at two verses uh, this morning. They're packed with content. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. This is God's holy, inerrant, and authoritative word. Set your minds on things that are above not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Let's also read verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. Almost three years ago, there was a, a massive environmental accident in Colorado. I used to live in Colorado, so I was interested in this accident. Uh, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, ironically, um, unintentionally released a massive toxic spill into a Colorado river. It was so massive, I think 3 million gallons of to toxic waste from a, a mine um, that were released into the river, that the river itself turned orange. And this orange-colored river flowed for miles and miles, I think it eventually even reached New Mexico. It was such a massive, massive uh, environmental catastrophe. As, as one report um, or one description said, contractors accidentally destroyed the plug holding water trapped inside the mine, which caused an overflow of the pond, spilling three million U.S. gallons of mine wastewater and tailings, including heavy metals such as cadmium and lead, other toxic elements such as arsenic, beryllium, zinc, iron, and copper into Cement Creek, a tributary of the Animas River in Colorado. Now, let's just imagine for a moment that you or I live right off of that river. And, and, and let's imagine that uh, some morning after the disaster, you turn on your faucet, and there's this orange sludge that comes pouring through the faucet, okay? Let's just imagine that. You wake up, you turn it on, uh, you have to take a minute because you haven't had your coffee yet to register um, this 
water looks strange. This is orange. What's happening right now? You turn it off. Maybe it's a dream. You turn it back on. Oh, it's, it's sludge again. And they tell you there's nothing you can do to fix these pipes. They're permanently contaminated. Now, thankfully, nearby your house, there is a freshwater spring. And you can run new pipes, and actually your whole neighborhood is going to have to do this. They run new pipes. Now you have a new pipe running into your sink, but before you get rid of the old one, it's still there, and you have these two pipes running into your sink. One runs fresh, clean, pure, healthy water, and one runs toxic sludge. Now the next morning you come to your sink and you stare at these two. Which do you turn on? Now that's an obvious choice. It's not even a choice, but it is actually a choice. It's actually the same choice that Paul says confronts us every moment of every day when it comes to our thoughts. It's the exact same choice. We have two sources. We have two very different types of thoughts that can run through our mind, that we can allow to perpetually circulate. And actually, uh, we're not able to stop thinking. And so it actually is the case that either one or the other of these water sources is running through our metaphorical pipes. It's more like one of those nifty little things you can have in your garden where you can turn it on and one side will run or the other side will run, but the water's always going. That's more what this is like. So it's, it's running either with toxic sludge or it's running with clear spring water. And that's what Paul is getting at. He's issuing a command, and if you know the book of Colossians, you know that Colossians has this, this exalted view, this focus on the glory of Christ and the impact his glory should have on the everyday lives of Christians. So if you've never read the whole book, I, I would recommend it. It was actually the first book we studied as a church. It was the book of Colossians. The, the glory of Christ and the impact that glory should have on our thinking and our everyday life. That, that's, that's what Colossians is talking about. And in this uh, little section, this paragraph right here, he speaks specifically of our mindset, our way of life. Verse 1 talks about the direction of our life. We're to seek the things, he says, that are above where Christ is. And then he redirects that general command specifically to the thought life of Christians in verse 2. Set your minds, he says, on things that are above. And to clarify, he doesn't just mean this kind of uh, atmospherically. Uh, he means it spiritually. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. If I, if I could use kind of a, a, maybe a less exalted phrase, I would say, think heavenly thoughts. Think heavenly thoughts, Paul would say. Turn on the heavenly flow of thinking. Think heavenly thoughts, and then he gives a motivation. If you look down there, there's a motivation. Look, notice the word for in verse 3. For, why should we do this? Why should we think heavenly thoughts? For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So it's a very simple flow of logic. Paul uses this lots of times. Do this because of who you are in Christ. That's actually could be the summary of a lot of what Paul says about the Christian life. Do this, be this, think this. Why, Paul? Because of who you are in Christ and what that means. So we might summarize it as think heavenly thoughts because your life is found in Christ. Think heavenly thoughts because your life is found in Christ. That's the command. Let's walk through. Let's look first at the command and then at this motivation. So the command there, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Paul also likes to paint contrast. He'll say something positively, and then just to be very clear, he'll explain that we're not to do the negative thing. So this isn't just something we do occasionally in the midst of the rest of our life. It's something we do instead of doing something else. You know the difference, right? The difference might be, Paul might say, sometimes think heavenly thoughts. And the rest of the time, feel free to think about things on this earth. But Paul makes it very clear. No, it's, it's not that kind of choice. It's not like there's 19 different faucets, and sometimes you should turn on the godly thoughts faucet. No, he says that there's, there's only two options. Always use this one and never use this one. This is one you should never use. 
This isn't like, oh, this is my afternoon sludge. No, 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 no never, never drink this one. And always drink this one. That's what he's saying here. Always think heavenly thoughts and do not set your minds on things that are on this earth. Now, b- before we get into the content of this command, I just want to make an obvious point. This is a command. And <laughs> as Americans, we hate commands. We don't like them very much. But the Bible's filled with commands. The, the, the idea of authority, God has authority over our minds. Let's just let that settle in for a minute. God has authority over your mind. J- Jesus said, we're to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Or Paul says in Philippians, let this mind be in you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Or Paul says elsewhere, we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Or he says that humanity can be divided into those who set their mind on the things of the spirit and those who set their mind on the things of the flesh. Or in Philippians, he says, think about these things that are excellent, praiseworthy, noble. So, so God seems to think that what goes on in our minds is, first of all, under our control normally and ultimately under his authority. The flow of thought through our mind is something we are responsible for. And it's something that should reveal the source of our life, our new life in Christ Jesus. Think a certain way. God says. It, it's similar and countercultural to when he says, feel a certain way. Boy, if there's anything in our culture that you, you think, it doesn't, it doesn't fit with what we're, our culture tells us is the idea that you can think certain things and you should feel certain things. The culture says, I can't help what I think and I can't help what I feel. The main goal of the culture is just be authentic. Just be honest about what you think and feel. God says, no, direct what you think and direct what you feel. It's a command, first of all. Now, the content of this command is that we're to set our mind, we're to fix our mind on things that are above, and he defines that where Christ is. He's talking about the exalted, risen Savior seated at the right hand of God. He's saying your mind should be filtered or filled up with the heavenly atmosphere that centers on God's sovereignty and the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't think, because if you look down there at verse 5, he seems to be continuing the thought because he says, therefore, he says, put to death, therefore, what is, and notice the word earthly in you. If you look down at your Bibles, you can see this connection. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. But now you must put them all away, put off the old Seth, and then look down at at verse 12. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. I I don't think when he's describing heaven and earth, uh, he's meaning a completely impractical way of thinking. That could be the way you could understand this. So just make your mind blank. Think clouds and goldenness and nothingness no 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 that that's not the idea and and don't you dare think about where you're driving Uh, that might be my preferred way of applying it my wife could tell you i just don't think about anything just start driving she just talked about when we first got married and i just would start driving and she would ask do you know where we're going And i would say well no i don't i don't actually know where we're going and she would look at me with a concentrated look and and say well why are you driving anywhere if you don't know where we're going (laughs) it's a good question I don't know. That's a, that's a really good question. It, it doesn't mean empty-mindedness, or you've heard the phrase, being so heavenly-minded you're of no earthly good. I think Paul would agree with that. No, this isn't like just staring, nothingness, you know, kind of a heavenly glory and euphoria that, that we, well, boy, I, I can't be bothered with, with mowing the lawn, and I, I can't be bothered with doing the budget, and I don't ask me to change diapers. I'm thinking about things above. No, 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 that, that's not what he's saying here. He, it, it's, if I can use, change the analogy a bit, he's saying that the heavenly priorities and the vision of God's throne room and the exalted Savior should be the lens through which you see everything that you see. 
the atmosphere, the purity, the glory of heaven where Christ is in his exalted state, the throne room of God, it should affect and flavor everything you think. So it's not that you don't think about driving or mowing the lawn or changing a diaper or talking to your spouse or relating to an enemy. It's that you think about those things with the mindset of heaven running through your brain. You think about things that are above and you let that shape how you relate to this earth. Obviously, Jesus is not about completely impractical, unloving, non-serving Christians. He's about heavenly-minded Christians, Christians whose mind is in keeping with heaven, whose mind, whose train of thinking would make sense in the heavenly throne room. So that what I'm thinking right now should be in keeping with a mind that is fixated on Jesus Christ and his glory and the exaltation of God. And a upside down kingdom where God is at the top and people are his servants, where holiness is supreme and sinfulness is rejected. That kind of thinking should be the focus of our minds. Set your minds on things above. What things are above? The glory of God is above. And the centrality of Christ is above. And the character of God is exalted above. And sin is rejected above. And impurity is hated above. And, and Satan is, 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 is despised above. All of those things are things that are above. God should be filling our minds, not with impracticality, but with heavenly-mindedness, otherworldliness should be the description of the Christian's mind. Set your mind on things that are above. We want our earthly thoughts and actions to be saturated by the perspective of heaven. We give too little thought to our thoughts. We give too little thought to our thoughts. We give thought to our actions, I think, as a Christian church in America. We give thought to our actions, what we do. We often even define sin that way. Don't do certain things. But we don't give a lot of thought to our thoughts. Would my thoughts seem like they are out of place in heaven? Should be a a constant thought of the Christian. Would my thoughts... Do they, do they seem to be flowing from a heavenly perspective right now? Let, let's make this very practical. It's Wednesday afternoon, and let's say you're, you're a mom with young kids, and this one will not go to sleep. They will not take their nap, and they were atrocious all morning, and you needed them to take their nap. This was a need, okay? Right then... Are you giving thought to your thoughts? Right then, are you setting your minds on things that are above? Like, God is sovereign. My Savior is on the throne. He is watching over me. He has called me to this difficult, exhausting task. This child is in the image of God and needs my care. God is patient with me when I am weak and don't do what I should. Wow, you, you need heavenly mindedness in that moment. Or let's say you're, you're working, for example, in your business, and all of a sudden you're, you're standing around at a corporate gathering, and the crude jokes start going around that re- are required almost to fit into the corporate culture. Don't don't you need a a heavenly mindedness right then where God is ultimately the author and the provider of your family's well-being and not you. And, And God is ultimately the only stature that you need and not the business stature. Don't, don't you need that? Or, or when there's a, a group of people that are all seem to be funny except for you. You ever had that experience? Everybody's funny here except for me. And so you feel the need, I, I got to tell a joke too, because everybody else is funny, and so I'll throw in my joke. Don't you need a heavenly mindedness right then? Isn't that a kind of a practical moment? It used to happen to me all the time. I have two brothers that are very funny, and I am not funny. And I grew up, and it was terrible. So they would be hilarious. They would be t- just effortlessly throwing out these witticisms and goofiness, and, and I would just think, I've got to get in on this action. 
And so I would try, and it would be like the humor vacuum. It was funny, and then you spoke, and now there's, that's, no, who cares? Let's go do some chores. <laughs> let, let, let's be done. You're like the black hole of humor. Stop it. Would you please stop right now? You're ruining my moment. Th th this, this is a moment where heavenly mindedness is needed. And you think, well, that, what does that have to do with anything? Well, in heaven, Christ is central. God's glory is central. And no one cares whether they are the focus in a moment. Amen. Set your minds where? On things that are above. And to make it explicitly clear, he adds the negative to the command. Not things that are on earth. Now, he doesn't mean don't ever contemplate the beauty of a tree. That is not what he means. We don't get that anywhere in Scripture. We're to delight in the glory of creation and the, the, the ingenuity of mankind and how they can reflect God and his creativity. No, we're to delight in those things. What he means is that aspect of earth where it is in rebellion against its creator I think he makes that clear when he, he defines this uh, heavenly thinking in practical ways when he says, put to death what's earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness. So, so what, what is this toxic sludge that comes into our mind? Well, guess where the source is? We are the source. It's our own sinful nature that's pouring our own sinful thoughts into our mind. Big label on that faucet says, your old self. And thoughts of comparison and, and arrogance and jealousy and complaining and bitterness and worry and anxiety and, and pride and, and defensiveness. You ever have the thought, you know, running around in your mind, man, if I'd only said that in that conversation, I, I could have got them then. Why do I always think of the perfect argument winner one hour too late? You ever find yourself crafting phrases that you can't wait to kind of unload on somebody? You ever find yourself in a, in a moment when, when somebody else is being acknowledged for something that you've also done, wondering when somebody is finally going to point out that, hey, I've done that too? And so you kind of subtly insert the comparison. Oh, yeah, I've, I found that to be difficult also. Have you ever had that moment? You know what that is? Selfish ambition. I want recognition. You know what that is? That's an earthly thought. Not earthly in terms of Montana or Texas or earthly in terms of sinful. Earthly in terms of you can be like God with the prominence of God. Think about yourself. Uh, sometimes this even happens with, with people, I think, that... They're not even talking about promoting themselves. They're, they're thinking about, you know, I, I wish I could be better. You ever had that experience? I wish I was more God. You know, I think self-pity thoughts are just disappointed pride. You've had self-pitying thoughts? I'm just, I can't believe I'm not a better dad, mom, mechanic, manager of my money, athlete. I, I'm not fit enough. I'm, I'm not funny enough. I just can't believe it. Over and over. You know what I think that is? Self-pity. I, th I think it's disappointed pride. On the back side of that's pride saying, wouldn't it be great if you were the greatest at this? And I I'd rather wish I was the greatest and still hang around in the self-pity pool than just acknowledge, I'm not. I'm not. And somebody else is much better than me at that. Humility moves on from self-evaluation, but self-pity stays there forever. Humility moves on to the sovereignty of God and the glory of God and the providence of God, and, and self-pity just stays there forever. So even seemingly godly introspection can turn into self-centeredness. I remember, I, I, this happened to me lots of times, where I would, I would do something that I thought was sinful. Ah, oh, that, that was a sinful thought. And then I would think about that for the next 10 hours. Have you ever had that experience? And I would think about it, and I would, I would go back and forth. Boy, I wish they didn't see that in me. Oh, this is terrible. 
I wish they wouldn't see that in me. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, I got to do an email. Oh, I wish they wouldn't see that in me. Over and over and round and round. You know what's at the center of that merry-go-round? Me! Me! Now, conviction is good, but real conviction always moves on to the joyful, humbling, exhilarating moment of grace. Amen. Yeah, you can't make up for it. You're not the perfect mom. Newsflash, you're not the perfect dad. You're not the most pure, godly man. No, you're not. No, you're not. You can't do anything about it. You can't atone for it by thinking about it for the next 10 hours. You can't atone for it by saying you're sorry 900 times. You can't atone for it. But there's one who can. Why don't you think about him? Think about the things that are above where Christ is. You know what's above? The wounds of Christ that speak of our forgiveness. Self is the sludge that runs through that pipe. Think about things that are above where Christ is, not things that are on earth. My friends, we have to give thought to our thoughts. Your thoughts are paraded before God every day. They are not hidden in comparison to your actions. They are paraded. They are seen. They are viewed. And so the best thing to do, if you want God to see your thoughts with approval, is to think about him. Jesus, the risen one, the forgiving one, the atoning one, the saving one, the sufficient one, the all-sustaining one. Let's think about him, things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Let's think about that. Let's think about this, this diaper or this car breaking down or this trial or this accident, this conflict, this difficulty, this suffering, this abuse, this, this painful moment. How do we think about that? We think about that in terms of heaven where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, where all wrongs will be made right, where all sins for his people will be forgiven. Think about heavenly thoughts, Paul says, not things that are on earth. That's the command. Let's look at the motive. Why? What's the reason for this? What is the, the reason for this thinking? Well, it's because objectively, your life, the essence of your life, is with Christ in heaven. That's what he says. You have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You have died, he says. What's he saying? He doesn't mean you in your unique personality that you like math and not English or you that you like Shakespeare and not comic strips or you that you like, you know, green mountain streams and not uh, desert oases. No, he's not talking about that side of you that's uniquely you. He's talking about the you that was in rebellion against him that identified as a rebel and a follower of the devil. That's the you he's talking about. And he's saying that part of you, if you're a Christian, was crucified with Christ. It's dead. It's dead, he says. It's spiritually dead. And this is the miracle of the gospel, that sinners who were clothed in a, a self that hated God, that, that their inner being was in rejection against God, by a miracle of mercy, that self was associated with the sinless one who never thought an evil thought. And all of those evil thoughts and deeds were counted as his. So that when he died, it was as surely as if we had died. When he suffered on the cross, it was in the sight of God as if our sinful thinking suffered. When he was crushed, it was as if we were crushed. When he was in agony, it was as if we were in agony for all of those sinful deeds. That's the glory of the gospel. It's not just this pardon that God chooses to forget your sins. It's that your sins were publicly displayed on Christ and publicly crushed by God and sent into the grave. And in that grave, they cannot rise again. What did he say? You have died. He could not say it more emphatically. This is Paul trying to get in our faces on Wednesday morning when we are battling that same self-centered thought that goes around and around and around. He's saying, 
You've died. That selfishness, it died with Christ. And of course, it's still, so to speak, left there in the pipes, but it's over with. This is your new source of life. Can you turn it on and see it dribble out and drain out? And does it still have the ability to be present in your mind? Well, of course it does. We're not actually in heaven yet. But the essence of our spiritual life has changed. We are no longer sourced from the toxic self. We are now sourced from the heavenly spring called Christ. So why in the world, Paul says... Would you keep thinking earthly things? Don't do it. Why? You died with Jesus Christ. When he died for my sins, my sinful nature died in him. And it's still present as a corpse zombie active in my life, but it has no power over me, and I have a new source of life. It's not the foundation of my life anymore. Instead, Christ is. I'm linked now to the living water of Christ. He says, look, look, look at the accent he puts on this. You have died. Well, well who am I, Paul? Your life. Your life, your real life, who you are, the essence of you. Where is it? Well, it's hidden. I, I know you can't see this right now. It's not as physical or tangible as your flesh that you can see in front of you, or maybe even your sin this week, but it is present. It's hidden with Christ in God. So that with Christ and in God, there you are. The, the real you is linked permanently. There is a, a vein of life that is the real you connected to Christ in God. Have you ever thought about it that way? Christians are just like sort of independent battery pack people. They're, they're linked. There is a spiritual vein of life that is linked to Christ in God so that when you were attached to Christ and he died, the old shell of life was left there in the grave and the new you rose with him and you are permanently, physically, spiritually, if I can say it that way, soldered to him so that his life flows into you. So, so earlier when Steve was talking about our, our identity in Christ, that this, is, this is what we're talking about, this, this connection. I belong to him. He belongs to me. And so to turn on the sludge of that old nature, its old way, it's as ludicrous and offensive as if you did that at the sink that morning. It should shock us in the same way. Turn it on, oh my gosh, what, 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 what am I doing we don't use that one anymore. Your life is hidden with Christ, but it won't always be hidden. Notice verse 4, when Christ, who is your life, appears. Paul, Paul doesn't repeat himself because he forgets. He repeats himself because we forget. He repeats himself because we tend to assume, well, each sentence is equally valuable. And how am I supposed to? No, Christ, who is your life, your life is hidden with Christ. Christ, who is your life, when he appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I have to make this point. This whole paragraph, one through four, notice the accent on Christ. You have been raised with Christ, he says. Seek the things above where Christ is. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Listen, Christian ethics is not primarily about willpower and self-identification. It's primarily about a, a being that has been recreated, connected to Jesus. It's primarily about identity that flows out in lifestyle. It's not primarily about self-designation. It's about Christ's union. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your future is wrapped up in Christ. When he appears, it's going to be life like for millions of Christians over the century. It's going to be as if finally I can say, now that is where I belong. 
if I can stretch the language a bit, it's almost as though you would say, now, now there I am. Th th there I am in him. I I'm a part of that. I I'm in him. Wh why do you think these things? Now it makes sense. Why do, you, why do you turn off those very normal, natural thoughts? Well, because that is my life. And anyone seeing that would understand why sludge toxicity could never flow from that. Anyone whose life is in that is never going to flow with yellow wastewater. Because there could not be a greater instant revelation of the ultimate purity than the revelation of Jesus Christ when he returns. So when he's connecting this to the mind, he's saying, since your life is in this exalted person who is more pure and majestic than anything you can imagine, since, since that is the actual source of your life, well, therefore, for, he says, your mind should flow with thoughts that are in keeping with the one who will be revealed to the world. Now, what does all this have to do with our thoughts Wednesday night, Monday morning, Friday night? We fix our mind on heaven. Though we can't see it now, it's hidden. One day, Christ, who is the real life, the real essence of our life, will return. And your life and my life, if you're a Christian, it's, it's tied up in him. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, well then, please call Christ your Savior. Acknowledge that sin is like toxic sludge in reality. We cover it over, we try to drink it, pretend like it tastes good, but, but really, it's grotesque to God, and it should be to us. And what Jesus says is, look, I, I will pay, I'll pay, I'll pay for the disaster that your sin has caused. And I'll let you drink freely of my grace and forgiveness and mercy that I have earned. I'll die for the toxicity of your sin, and you receive the pure blessing of my righteousness. That's what salvation is. That's what Christianity is. Our sin for his righteousness. Our death for his life. His death for our sin. That's the invitation of the gospel. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus, listen, this is the way to live. This is the way to live. Drink the water of believing in Jesus. Trust me, it'll seem strange if you're used to the taste of waste. It will transform your heart and your life. And even the best that Christianity now, the very best of it, the, the very most glorious Christian moment any Christian has ever experienced, you know what it is? It's a hidden glory. The very most majestic, ecstatic, rejoicing Christian you've ever seen. And Christian, this is good news for you too. The most exalted, ecstatic, worshipful moment you've ever experienced. You know what it is? It's a hidden glory. And even in its hidden state, isn't it glorious? Isn't it refreshing? Isn't it delightful? Isn't it wonderful to know Christ? Imagine what it will be like when the hidden becomes seen. We give too little thought to our thoughts. Brothers and sisters, give some thought to your thoughts. Ask yourself, what am I thinking right now? I think you'll find that often we have a screensaver of self. How righteous am I? How unrighteous am I? How have they harmed me? How am I a victim? How have I been betrayed? How have I been treated? How am I being promoted over and over and over and over? How funny am I? How not funny am I? How good am I at this or that at the other thing? It just runs around me. But in Christ, we can get off the merry-go-round of self and start enjoying thinking about him. 
So conviction leads to him, and need leads to him, and, and difficulties lead to him, and conflict leads to him, and suffering leads to him. Yes, we have those moments where we acknowledge this is painful, this is difficult, why won't this child sleep? But then the thought leads up to him, oh Christ, I need you right now. I, I need you, Lord Jesus. I, I need you to help me. I need you to sustain me. Help me to be like you. And we experience him in that moment. Our thoughts are heavenly thoughts. Your life is tied up with Christ. Your thoughts should flow from him and to him. Christ is our life. He should be the character of our thoughts. Heaven, to change the analogy yet again, should be the filter of our thoughts. Our mind should be disciplined by our new identity as a Christian. Look, there have been moments in my life when the only way I could stop thinking selfish thoughts was to think active thoughts about God over and over and over again. Because if I wasn't doing it actively, passively, the selfish thoughts would come flowing through. I would find hours had gone by thinking about myself. The only solution was to say, God is great. God is... Sometimes I do it in the car. If I'm really struggling, I'll just talk out loud to myself in the car. I'll force myself to think heavenly thoughts. You are strong. You are powerful. You are great. You are able. You are loving. You are kind. You are forgiving. You are my salvation. And sometimes just hearing your own voice makes a difference. It helps your mind get off the track of self-centeredness or self-pity or hopelessness or despair or anger or self-righteousness and onto the track of heavenly mindedness. Listen, anxious thoughts have no place in heaven because Christ holds all things in his hands. Bitter thoughts even bitter thoughts based on genuine sin against us. Painful sin against us. Bitter thoughts, they have no place in heaven because Christ died for us as his enemies and loved us while we were yet sinners. Condemning thoughts have no place in heaven because Christ still has the scars of our sin on his hands. Proof that he paid for every sinful thought and every rebellious deed. Selfish thoughts have no place in heaven because in heaven every mind is filled with the glory of Jesus Christ who is the heir of all things and who will reign until God puts all things under his feet who is the name above every name. And you could go on and on and on. Ask yourself the question this week. Would this thought make sense in heaven? And if you are having a train of thoughts that can't seem to be derailed, ask for help from a Christian who will tell you the truth. Sometimes, because it's our own mind, it's very confusing about what actually is of the Lord and what isn't. Sometimes conviction that has become condemnation can seem like righteousness. And, and sometimes a kind of assurance that actually has become complacency can seem like righteousness. And, and we don't know the difference. And so we need a Christian friend to come alongside us and say, well, now, um, can I ask you this question? And to redirect our mind into heavenly train of thinking. Brothers and sisters, think heavenly thoughts because your real life is in heaven. We went on a, a short vacation last week, and I have, uh, everybody loved it, but we had one, I have one son who just loves being home. And when we came home, um, he said something interesting to me. I think he was trying to get something across, and he basically said, if I remember it right, Dad, I know this place. I think he was trying to get across the the, the familiarity of it, and, and this, is, this is mine. I, I know this place. It should be that way for the thoughts of a Christian. When we're there, you know what it should feel like? Oh, I know this place. This, this is home. You know why? I've been thinking here my whole life. Let's pray.
Lord Jesus, I ask for grace for our thoughts. Lord, where, where our thoughts have been <laughs> the sludge of our sin, Lord, forgive us. Thank you for paying for sinful thoughts. Where our thoughts, Lord Jesus, need to be received from you, filled with your word, overwhelmed by truth, making sense in heaven. Lord, give us your thoughts. Thank you for your word, which is your authoritative thoughts given to us. I pray you'd fill our mind with it. I thank you for the gospel, Lord, that, Lord, gives us life in you. We're not doing this in our own strength or making up a new way of thinking, Lord, that we can derive this from you, that you are pouring your life into us by your spirit. I thank you, Lord Jesus. Give us grace to be a heavenly-minded body of believers. In Jesus' name.